5.1 Filthy Lucre Filthy Lucre Money gained in a dishonest or dishonorable way That's the simple yet accurate definition of filthy lucre The money itself takes on no magical residue of its ill-gotten past Money is inanimate and is not to blame for human actions Therefore it can carry with it no guilt of past deeds Stolen money in the possession of thieves, robbers, crony corporations, crony executives, crony bankers, politicians, and other such scum is unowned property and available for rightful homesteading. Additionally, since these crime gang members are routinely guilty of either direct aggression on the innocent or are guilty of aggression through proxy, none of the property they have come to possess under any circumstances is protected by natural rights theory and is therefore rightfully unowned. It's part of the duty of a properly functioning justice system to acquire such funds and utilize those funds to accomplish the three aspects of justice listed above, namely assurance, recompense, and revenge. Starting with assurance, we cannot assure victims that the robbery won't continue so long as the crime gang known as the state continues to function. So one of our priorities in dealing with filthy lucre should be to safely extract as much as possible from the criminals and repurpose it for our cause of ending the state. Methods of liberating the filthy lucre of the state will vary widely, according to the skill levels of activists and the opportunities presented in our interaction with state actors. However, it is imperative that we maintain our principles. We cannot terrorize the innocent, and the families of state actors are not guilty by default. We must be surgical and precise in our handling of state actors, and whenever possible we should stay anonymous and keep the purpose of our cause hidden for as long as possible. 6. Winning. The Lesson of Algeria Algeria was invaded, then violently and mercilessly conquered by France in the 1830s. For over 100 years, Algeria was a military colony where land wars stolen from its traditional owners and handed out to waves of European immigrants who were then favored by the French legal system over the indigenous Muslim and Jewish Algerians. All that changed on November 1, 1954, when guerrilla fighters began a war that lasted until France was humiliated and forced to resign in 1962. During that brief war from 1954 until 1962, France was so devastated that France itself almost erupted in a civil war. And all of this was made possible by a small group of irregular warriors called the National Liberation Front. By 1960, the French force in Algeria was in excess of 300,000 highly trained combat troops supplied with the most modern equipment. At its peak of power during the war, the National Liberation Front numbered something less than 30,000 fighters, poorly equipped with only light weapons when they had weapons at all. At one point in the city of Algiers, the clandestine warfare organization was comprised of approximately 1,200 armed men and 4,500 persons unarmed. Yet the Algerians soundly defeated the French. They did so by using strike-and-run tactics, by avoiding open conflict, and by hiding in plain sight. At one point, a major leader of the NLF had his operation headquarters only a few hundred meters from a French stronghold in Algiers. The French could neither see nor understand their enemy, so the French never had a chance. As the respected French authority on the Algerian war and on irregular warfare, Roger Trinque stated, We know that the sine qua non of victory in modern warfare is the unconditional support of a population. According to Mao Zedong, it is an essential to the combat as water to the fish. Such support may be spontaneous, although that is quite rare and probably a temporary condition. If it doesn't exist, it must be secured by every possible means, the most effective of which is terrorism. When Trinquier speaks of terrorism, he is speaking of a situation where local fighters harass both authority and the civilian population, and at the same time the authority is unable to maintain security for the local population. So the population both fears the terrorism and hate the authority for failing to provide security. In our version of ethics-based irregular warfare, the attacks would be on authoritarian individuals and on infrastructure, but never directly on the civilian population. As attacks increase in number and effectiveness, the population more and more will blame authorities while authorities have no one to crack down on except the innocent civilian population. Reading Roger Trinquet's 
analysis of the Algerian War and his assessment of the French Indochina War are fascinating and informative, but not completely applicable to our purposes. The two assumptions of authoritarians in regards to warfare is that either geography must be controlled or populations must be controlled, with the goal to control both. We must reject this. We can never attempt to control either. Our path to victory and the death of the state will rely upon our practice of never directly engaging the might of the state while always respecting the lives and property of the civilian population. Whenever possible, we should avoid terrorizing the public or inciting panic in any way. Whenever our target must be a public one, that target should be hated. Otherwise, don't let it look like a hit. We must never incite sympathy for the devil. The final lesson of Algeria is the lesson of every revolution throughout history. When the French abandoned Algeria, the old faraway tyrant was replaced by a new local tyrant, and the cycle of the state continued. This is what revolutions always produce. Therefore, we must not engage in revolution. We must strike, we must agitate, we must provoke, but mostly we must provide the framework for the above-ground network to teach and advertise a better option than the slavery of the state until the day that the market demand shifts and people stop wanting the state. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and consider supporting us on Patreon.